Stand up in the fear of God and listen to the Holy Gospel, a chapter from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the evangelist, apostle, and pure disciple. May his blessings be with our soul. Amen. From the Psalms, our teacher, David, the prophet and king. May his blessings be with us all. Amen. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house, so the king will greatly desire your beauty, because he is your Lord. Worship him. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, glory be to you forevermore. Amen. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren, for with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servants of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Today, as we just heard the gospel of the Annunciation of Archangel Gabriel to St. Mary, that she's going to conceive and give birth to the Savior of the world. This Annunciation, or we, the, the Church and the Fathers say that the Feast of the Annunciation is the gate 
to all the other feasts of the Lord. Why is that? Because everything started here at the Annunciation. The salvation that God has prepared for us from the foundation of the world, this was the time that's going to be starting. From the time that Archangel Gabriel announced to St. Mary that she's going to conceive and give birth to our Savior. Why is that? Because the Annunciation led to the Nativity, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, and because of his birth, he died on the cross for us and was resurrected. So we celebrate the Feast of the Annunciation, then the Nativity, then the Resurrection. And this feast is, has a huge um, a greatness in the church, and that's why the church and her wisdom has made every 29th day of the Coptic month, except for two months in the year, we celebrate whenever there's a 29th uh, day of the Coptic month, what happened? The church say this is a commemoration of this lordly feast, the, the Annunciation, the Nativity, and the Resurrection. And we read the readings about the Annunciation. So you'll hear this reading a lot. That means it's the 29th day of the Coptic month, and that means we're remembering this important feast. But this feast of the Annunciation is the beginning of all feasts. And this is very important, and this is actually the church, in everything the church does in the rites, everything has a meaning to it. Even the way the icons are placed in the church has meanings, delivering messages. For example, if we come, you may not see all of you because of that blocking. If you see the icon here, you see the icon whenever we come to the church, we we'll always find our Lord Jesus Christ, and on his right, St. Mary, carrying our Lord Jesus Christ. This is in every church you will see that. But then if you notice next to it, next to the icon of St. Mary carrying Christ, there's the icon of what? That's Archangel Gabriel and St. Mary. This is what we're talking about today, the Annunciation. Archangel Gabriel and announced the good news to St. Mary. But why does the church put these two icons together? Why? It has a meaning. It's telling us something. It's telling us every time you enter the church, you'll see St. Mary carrying Christ. She's the mother of God. She gave birth to our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. But where did all that start? It starts from there, from the Annunciation. So we put next to each other. So it starts there, and this is the end result. It starts with the Annunciation, and the outcome of the Annunciation is our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything has a meaning in our beautiful church, and we need to study all these things to actually benefit and understand more. And that's the importance of this Annunciation. But this Annunciation, it's not just for St. Mary. The, the message for us today, that this announcement, this is, we call the glad tidings, is for us, each one individually. And this message or announcement has two aspects to it, two sides to it. The first part is, God is sending a message, and the other side is I'm as a human being responding to that message. God is sending a message, and how do I respond to that message? And we see here that our Lord Jesus Christ did what he promised. From the very beginning, from the time of Adam and Eve, from the very, very beginning, God promised salvation. And we see this in the uh, book of Genesis from the very beginning. And we see this clearly in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, when the, the Bible tells us this. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. What is this talking about? This is when Adam and, and Eve sinned. God says, I've prepared salvation for you. He said to the devil, I'm going to bring you a seed that will save mankind. And this seed of woman is, as the fathers in the church told us, that's our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the seed of woman who was born of St. Mary to come and save all mankind. So God has, prom has fulfilled his promise from the very beginning of salvation. Today he said, now I'm fulfilling his promise. God is always faithful. When he promises something, he delivers. 
And today he delivered his part. He fulfilled his promise. He said, remember back in Genesis chapter 3 when I said, I'm going to save you. I'm going to take care of this. The fall of Adam and Eve, God had to restore Adam to his first state. And this is the beginning of it with that beautiful glad tidings, beautiful announcement to St. Mary. So God has fulfilled his part, has fulfilled his promise. And this gives us faith that God is always faithful. God, whatever he promises, he delivers on his promise. So that's what he's doing today. What about my part? What about my response? Send Mary's response here with what? Let it be according to your word. But some people say, well, she didn't believe. She was, she was saying to uh, Archangel Gabriel, how can that be? And he, he said here when he said, she said, how can this be since I do not know a man? He, she's not doubting the message. She's not doubting that. She's just questioning, how does that happen? Because I'm a virgin. How can a virgin give birth? I didn't plan to be a mother. I want to dedicate my whole life to God. So now, how is it going to be affected now? We never heard of a virgin giving birth before. So she was not doubting the message. Not unlike Zechariah last week when he doubted the Archangel Gabriel about the birth of his son John. That's a different thing altogether. Zechariah last week, he doubted that this cannot happen. It's impossible. How, that, how can that happen? I'm old and my wife is old. That's lack of faith. And that's why he was made mute because he's not believed what the message was. But he said Mary is inquiring because how can that be? She's asking about how is that possible? How can that be? I don't know, man. So she has faith here and she never doubted that message. And the evidence of that is the response that Archangel gave, gave back to her. He explained to her. He told her, look, this is how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. That's it? That's the answer? Is that like a sort of a, a very logical answer? Yeah, no problems. Have we ever heard of this before? The Holy Spirit come upon someone and they make them pregnant? Never heard of that before. Never heard of that before. So her, the response was not even convincing for anyone who is using their mind. For anyone who is relying on logic and has no faith, that response would not be sufficient anyway for St. Mary. But she accepted it. That means... She had faith and she was not arguing with the message. She was just merely inquiring about how it's going to happen. And that's why when God's sending a message, there has to be these two elements. God sent me a beautiful message today about salvation. What is my response? Do I have faith in that message or do I doubt it? You know how many times God is sending us beautiful news, the glad tidings every day in the Bible. Do I actually accept that? Or because of my lack of faith, I don't accept it. I say, where's the good news? God is sending us messages every day in the Bible. How many times God says, I love you in the Bible? How many times say, you are beloved, you are mine, you're special to me? But do we believe that message? Do we actually take it as a personal message? Or do we read the Bible as a history book, as a story book, as a blessing, and we just, you know, read it and kiss it and put it back on the shelf and just continue on with our life. We just take a blessing. No, this is a message for us personally. This is not a message just for one person. Whenever we read a story like that in the, in the Bible, we need to take the Bible as a personal message for me. Personalize it to you. It's to each one of us. And this is the problem. We don't benefit from the Bible is because we take it as a true. We take it as, I need to read the Bible because the Buddha told me, because it's part of my spiritual exercise, because I feel guilty if I don't read the Bible. What is the point of reading the Bible? I need to take it as a personal message for me. As a personal message for me, as a beautiful message that will give me a hope. If I take every time I read that God said to someone, I love you, I'll take care of you, you're special to me, he's saying to, the, to, that, to me personally, by name. Take the name and put your name instead. This is how we benefit from the Bible. God's sending us many messages, but the reason we don't benefit is because we don't take it personally. For example, he said, I love you many times, but how come many people feel lonely and they don't feel loved and they complain 
that no one loves them. Even their family don't love them. Even husband and wife have problems. They don't love each other. Why? It's because they haven't really believed that God loves them. If I believe that God loves me, then everything else around me will make sense. If I know my, my position in God's eyes, who I am in God's eyes, nothing in the world will satisfy me if I'm not satisfied with God's love. And that's why people go and search for the wrong love. is because they have, not, they have not been satisfied with God's love. Why? Because they don't believe in God's love. Because they just read the Bible as a history book, as a story book, not as a personal message for them. If we take this, if we understand this, will make all the difference in the way we approach the Bible. Another example, how many times the Bible says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. How many times? The Father tells us 365 times. Why? God is sending a message every day of the year. 365 times every day, He's telling me, do not be afraid. Do not worry. Do not be afraid. But then how many times do we get worried? How many times, you know, we wake up in the middle of the night thinking about a problem and we can't sleep because we're worried. We're worried about tomorrow. We're worried about our health. We're worried about our finances. I'm worried about my job. I'm worried about my marriage. I'm worried about my kids. We just, you know, we just make a list of the worries and keep adding to it. What about all these promises in the Bible? What do you do with them? Are they just written there for the creation? Are they just written here to fill pages? No, God is sending this message to me personally. He's saying, do not be afraid. I'm with you. Do not worry. I'll take care of this. Again, if we read the Bible and apply this, it makes all the difference. And many, many things, you know, in terms of joy. As a Christian, I should be a joyful person. God tells us, rejoice. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. But I decide, no, today is a bad day. I'm going to rejoice tomorrow. If something happens, then I'm going to rejoice. If I get this result, I'm going to be happy. If I get this job, I'm going to be happy. What about today? What's happening with today? Am I rejoicing today? God says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. All these beautiful promises that God is giving us every day, we just need to open our Bibles. The problem is... We don't read our Bible, so we don't know the promises that God has given us to live a fulfilling life. God wants us to live a happy, joyful, fulfilling life. And that's why he said, I have come that I may have life and may have it more abundantly. God, as a Christian, I should be joyful. I should, I should have no worries. I should feel God's love. This, me as a Christian, And that's why the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, and peace, etc. Why? This is what a Christian should look like. We should be a source of peace and joy to others. When we see each other, we greet each other with a smile. And coming out of peace, we have the peace in our heart because we know God loves us. Many people don't believe that. Many people believe that because they do a particular sin, God hates them. God doesn't love them. Who said that? Who said that? God loves us so much. That's why he died for us. And that's why uh, St. John today in the Catholic epistle, he said this, he says, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all the righteousness. How? We're just repenting. Very simple. Come back to God and say, sorry, God. Repent. Say, forgive me, Lord. Come and confess. Come and practice the beautiful sacraments of repentance and confession. We are towards the end of the year. This is the best time to come back to God and repent and say, God, help me to stop this sin. Nothing is too hard for God. If you're willing to do your part, God will do his part. And that's why he said he, the, the problem is if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, as St. John said. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Our sin will remain. But if we say, if we confess our sins, that's why he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. That's simple. Yes, that's simple. God is waiting for us. But we have to return. But we return when we feel his love for us. And that happens through reading his promises in the Bible. Many people don't even open the Bibles. 
And the people who open the Bibles, they don't read it in the right way. They don't, uh, they don't get the message from it. They're reading, as we said, as a, any type of book for a blessing, whatever. But what's the point? The Bible is our guide for life. We read it and we apply it. I can even take one verse today and apply it for my life. And that will protect me from living the life like the rest of the world. We shouldn't be living like the rest of the world because we guarded by the word of God. God today has sent, has fulfilled his promise. He said, I'm starting now the process of salvation. Are you going to accept this good news? When we sin and we get away from God, we say, God, I did not accept that. I don't care about your salvation. You did it for someone else, not for me. But he said, no, I did it for you. And I've died for you by name. You're not just a number. Even God cares about us, even when we don't care about ourselves. God cares about the little things in our life. God even numbered the, our hair. He's trying to tell us, look how much I care about you. I even numbered how many hairs you have in your head. Why? Because I'm trying to tell you how much I care for you. So if I care about the small things, don't you think I'm going to care about the big things in your life? If I care about the birds and the, and the flowers and the grass that come for a day and then it withers away and looks beautiful with all the beautiful colors, something that's temporary, don't you think I'm going to care about you that's eternal? Because we are eternal. Our spirits are eternal. That's why I get, God cares about it. Where I'm going to end in eternity. What's going to happen to me? That's why God is saying, this is the thing. If we have to worry, can I tell you this? If we have to worry, if you want to put something on your worry list, this is the only thing that should be on your worry list, my eternity. And unfortunately, this is the last thing on our list. That's true. We worry about everything else except our eternity. We do everything else except worry about our eternity. If you want to worry about something, if you feel obliged to worry about something, this is what we should be concerned about. My eternity, where I'm going to spend my eternity. And work towards that. And our beautiful church have supplied us with all the means to do that. The means of salvation. The sacraments in the church. Come. Come back to the church and repent and confess and start the new year on the beautiful white page. Because God will wipe away all sins that you repent and confess about. This is her promise today. And that's why he came and died for us to give us that. So let us utilize that. And let us use this beautiful announcement today. That's for me personally. And everything you hear in the church, in the sermons, in the readings, whenever you read the Bible, take it as a personal message for you. God is talking to you. And that's why if you read the Bible really with humility and after praying, you may read the same verses They've read before, but they'll have a special meaning to you this time. You'll feel a special message because that's the word of God. It's living. It's not old-fashioned. It, it doesn't become obsolete, but it's always living and effective in our life. Glory be to God forever. <laughs> Amen.